All right. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so my name is David. I'm head of DevRel at Tyco. And today I'll be talking about horizontal scaling for L2s. All right, so first for the more beginners in the audience, we'll give an overview of the scaling problem. And then we'll talk about some current scaling ideas that you're probably familiar with that L2s are, are working on to address the scaling problem. And then I'll, we'll talk about new precompiles that we are suggesting uh, to introduce that we want to get feedback on that will enable um, a new idea that we've been working on, which is called booster rollups. And then we'll briefly talk about an idea called the singularity. Okay, so uh, to give an overview of the scaling problem, uh, yeah, that was just a picture of my cat. Like I changed the analogy, but I didn't want to remove the picture. Um, but uh, anyways, so uh, with Ethereum, like uh, one way to think about wanting to solve the throughput problem is if you consider a uh, transaction on Ethereum as just driving from one source to one destination as a transaction, then you can think of a scaled world of Ethereum as one where cars are just driving all over the place, right? People get to go and visit cool places and, and there's a lot of traffic going on. So a fundamental uh, way to enable this world is you need to have a lot of gas to, par to power all of these cars to get to all of these destinations, which are, you know, uh, in, in this analogy, transactions on Ethereum. So you need a lot of gas. And the thing about Ethereum is that Ethereum bounds the gas supply uh, that they offer for people to use uh, for every 12 seconds. So Ethereum um, likes to target that at around 15 million gas for every 12 seconds. So anytime you want to go from, you know, Miami to California or wherever, whatever you want to do in the network, it requires some gas and yeah, there's only so much. So the throughput of Ethereum is bottlenecked by this, uh, this bounded gas supply. So there's a few ways to like, yeah, enable more cars to be like moving around, uh, you know, in the world. You know, w one way we can do that is if you have a system, if you can double the speed that the cars are going, uh, then you can allow um, double the amount of traffic in, right? So uh, the EVM is a single thread. If you could double the single thread performance, then you could uh, double the uh, throughput of the overall system. An another way you could do it is just by doubling the amount of lanes in inside of the system, right? Um, but the key insight that I want to give to people here who are you know, just trying to learn about this scaling problem is even if we did uh, double the lane speed, if we doubled the amount of throughput, it actually doesn't make Ethereum scaling any better. Um, and uh, some of you probably already know that, that we could actually scale Ethereum more today if we wanted to. Uh, the EVM has the performance for it. The nodes have the performance for it. The real reason that we have a scaling problem is because we have a state growth problem. So we, we, um, we want to limit the amount of gas that um, is used in the network every 12 seconds so the state doesn't just like blow up really fast. Um, so yeah, and, and, and the reason we do that is because we don't want it to become too difficult for people to run nodes on the network and participate in the important job of consensus. So yeah, that's, that's the general scaling problem and that's why we have decided to do this roll-up centric roadmap. We've decided that we want to take the amount of uh, you know, gas that we have inside of a block and represent a bunch of uh, different transactions on L2s. Um, instead, we just use uh, the layer one as a data availability layer for execution that happens on like L2s or other places. So current scaling ideas like uh, popular in recent days are like validiums or alternate uh, data availability layers. Um, also like uh, plasmas seem like, I guess they're back or something. Um, and yeah, for, uh, 4844 as well is um, another way to open up this uh, gas supply. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a kind of like a different uh, fee market, but it, it opens up some more uh, data for Ethereum. Um, so yeah, the current scaling ideas now are like um, a lot of roll-up teams are working on trying to create some type of composable, uh, like a, sh a sh shared uh, network of, of horizontal L2s that share the same security and share the same bridge and have good uh, bridging between them. So some things like this are like the super chain, Polygon CDK. Um, I believe ZK Sync is working on things like this. 
And this is great because we do need to address uh, the horizontal, uh, we do need multiple L2s uh, to, um, to uh, you know, scale Ethereum. And ideally, those L2s have the same uh, shared security model. And so they're not like, you know, it's not like we're scaling L2s by just like spinning up another L2 company, you know, <laughs> like we just, ideally we can, yeah, ha have some shared, shared security instead of having like a, so many different bridges and so many different yeah, security mechanisms. So in, in that sense, these ideas are great. Um, there's one kind of like a, a little bit of a downside to it as well. Like one is there is some uh, fragmentation between these different L2s. You know, if you're a DAP developer or someone, you know, is working on a protocol, you may feel that like, oh, you need to deploy it to this L2, that L2, like all these other L2s because you're trying to find the best ecosystem and you want to be a part of that ecosystem. So there is still like some fragmentation. So one idea that um, we've been uh, working on at Tyco is just answering this question of can we skip the uh, like copy paste deploy um, to L2s, right? Like is there a way to maybe scale, um, offer some of this scaling without asking developers to redeploy their application onto L2? Um, so first we're gonna talk about some pre-compiles and then we'll get back into that idea. This idea of can we have offer scale to L1 apps without asking to re redeploy. So these pre-compiles will enable that. Um, and yeah, so the three that we're gonna talk about here is L1 sandbox call, L1 delegate call, and L1 call. And the easiest way to think about this is we came to the conclusion that like if you're an L2 node, um, you need to have access to the data availability layer where you're posting your rollup transactions, right? So you can build uh, your, your, your L2 node. So we know that L2 nodes always have access to some L1 node. They uh, have to, either over an RPC or they're likely running an L1 node themselves. So because L2 nodes already have access to an L1 node, oh uh, yeah, we are suggesting that you can call this L1 node that they already have on hand. So one thing you could do, for example, is like reading Oracle data that exists on L1 or simulating some transaction inside of the L1 node that you have access to. And that's essentially what these uh, pre-compiles do. And we like to think of them as like kind of generic and hopefully nice building blocks for some creative ideas that we can come up with um, for, for L2s. Um, so let's um, let's go through some uh, uh, some pseudocode. I think it'll make it easier to understand how these precompiles would work. Is this a laser pointer? Okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll go over the sandbox call first uh, here on the left. So this is super simple. At the very top here, we just have a contract that uh, increments a count. So it just stores one variable, and you can increment it. Um, and then here is where we're gonna be testing this contract and showing how the precompile works. So in the first statement, we're just calling, uh, on, we're calling the increment function on this L1 contract and we're uh, using the sandbox call. So this will increment the L1 contract and it'll return a value of one, right? So it adds, it adds one to this zero and you can assert it's a value of one. And at the end of the precompile, uh, you can see that uh, if you call count, this is just a simple like get uh, method for uh, this variable here, you can see that it's zero, which means that the sandbox call, as it sounds, just simulated a call to your L1 node from layer two, and it discarded the state changes at the end. And the second uh, precompile here is called L1 delegate call. So this one is basically, um, it's the same situation. We have this counter contract on L1, and this time we're calling this increment, but we're using delegate call. So what is delegate call? Delegate call basically means you're going to simulate uh, the call again. You're gonna do the call inside of your L1 node, except you use the storage of the calling contract. So you can see in this L2 contract, we have at storage slot zero, this variable L2 count set to 10. So what it does is it calls, it does read the contract uh, code of this L1 contract, it reads the increment function, but it uses the storage of the L2. Um, and yeah, so it increments it to a value of 11, and then we can see here in the delegate call that the, the state changes are persisted at the end of the precompile. Okay, and then we'll talk about this L1 call, which is kind of an, um, a more extreme version. Uh, so what this does is you can 
call this precompile l1 call it executes it um, it, it executes against the uh, layer one contract and what it does is the node will keep track of a list of state changes that happened for contract address and storage slot pairs. So for some smart contract, if it's like, okay, this is the first time that I've touched this storage slot, it'll add it to the list. And then if you touch this storage slot again, it'll update that value. So basically you just have a list that just keeps track of the changes that are happening for each contract and storage slot. Um, for, for yeah, these L1 contracts. And then at the end, you batch all of those changes and you just apply, you provide a proof and you uh, apply uh, this state delta. Uh, we, we, uh, this is just like uh, called apply state updates. It, it takes the, uh, the, the list of changes and it just loops through the values and updates the storage slots on L1. So it didn't execute the transactions, it executed the transactions in the L2, which were covered by the ZK EVM. Um, and that's actually a good uh, point to mention. A lot of these new precompile features, if you're familiar with the ZK space, are kind of like you would normally be kind of careful about it because you would want, you'd be like, oh, we need to implement this in the circuits. But with the advent of these ZK VMs, these general purpose ZK VMs, adding precompiles like this are a little bit easier. So yeah, this will get covered by the ZK EVM. You provide a proof for the state delta, and then you just apply the state updates uh, on L1. Okay, so let's let's talk about the uh, idea that I alluded to in the beginning about can we have like developers scale their L1 application without needing to deploy to L2? Um, so this is the idea of the booster rollup. Um, so the basic idea is is a booster rollup is a rollup that executes transactions as if they were executing it on the L1, except it's doing it on L2. So the L2 is like um. For every uh, account on the L2, you have this um, pre-deployed uh, a smart contract. Um, actually, this wouldn't really be a, sm a smart contract. This would just kind of be implemented in the client because otherwise this would uh, change the gas costs. But th just for example's sake, you have for every account, like you will proxy calls to the L to the L1 node that you have access to, right? And what the L1 and so basically, you, yeah, you just every contract that exists on L1 has the exact same contract address on L2. Um, so everything you you instantly inherit all the contracts that are on L1 by doing this proxying. So yeah, you can like let's say you just have like an NFT contract or something, uh, and you want to get like a total balance. Um, you would literally just do like an L1 call or like an L1 sandbox call from L2 and you'd be able to retrieve that value. So everything is there like out of the gate. Um, and what does this change for um, the, re the really great thing, uh, the, the positive for this, is it becomes really easy for DAP developers. Like they don't need to think about deploying the L2. All they do is they just manage a smart contract on L1 and it's as simple as that. The downside is that they would have to like opt into this like shared uh, storage and execution model where you, yeah you kind of shard the uh, the storage across these uh, multiple booster rollups in parallel, which could augment the developer experience a little bit, right? Like developers would have to suddenly think about uh, how can their DAP support like parallelization. Um, so this could be considered some a little bit of a downside. Um, but the nice thing is is Developers can choose. They can choose to use booster rollups if they want to, and I think this is uh, very. Uh, I think this will be very popular. Um, but if they don't want to, then they can just deploy their contract to Tyco or any other rollup in the normal way and and scale in that way. So it's really up to the developer. Uh, the nice thing about booster rollups is that there's no more bridge. So like the security is kind of contained within the actual app. Um, so yeah, it's it's a little bit. And it, it seems to me that for a lot of developers, this will be an enticing option to only need to manage uh, a smart contract in one place. Um, so yeah, this is the, the basic idea of booster rollups. Um, another thing I'll, I'll mention is that even if you're not, a, a booster rollup disables deployments uh, because you want the booster rollup to always be perfectly mirroring the L1. So this also means that booster rollups wouldn't uh, uh, shouldn't have like self-destruct enabled, but that should be going away anyways. Um, but if 
if other L2s decide to implement these precompiles, they could take advantage of boosting too. They could take advantage of this, what we think is a very open and flexible design space, right? Of being able to call L1 from L2 and, and have that covered in the ZK EVM. So, um, yeah, this is just a funny picture that our CTO came up with. Uh, they're like little roll ups and booster chairs. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. This is a mouthful, but you know, at Tyco, if you're not familiar uh, with some of the architecture, you can find any of us in pink shirts. We'll be happy to talk about it. But uh, yeah, we're a base rollup. That means we don't have a sequencer. We just use the L1 validator set for sequencing. And this idea of having based booster rollups that share some type of validity is uh, how we are thinking would be an interesting way to create like a unified single chain uh, that can kind of like scale Ethereum. Um, and the, the main way that you end up doing that, you know, we can, we can go uh, into more depth. It's a little bit of a, a dense topic, but I do have resources at the end. But the main way to think about doing that is you, your smart contracts will have some type of bus or some type of storage that they keep track of on the L1. And they make sure that what they're doing across of these, L2, uh, these separate L2s, all these L2s that you have in parallel, are kept uh, track and in sync across all of the L2s. So let's say you wanted to like transfer like some, uh, yeah, some token from one L2 instance of an L2 to another one. Then you kind of write this into the bus contract. You verify that with a proof. Like it would need some type of uh, fast proof, like a SGX proof or fa fast ZK proofs. Um, and as long as those things are in sync and you have a shared sequencer like a base rollup does, uh, then you're able to execute atomic transactions. So you can transfer something on one rollup. If you check that the bus, this uh, shared bus is the same, then you can also mint it on another rollup in the same block. Um, and you, you get that with base rollups or any type of shared sequencer. I know that's a mouthful. Uh, no worries. If you, if you want to learn more about it, just uh, you can scan this QR code. Um, and I left a bunch of resources here that if you're interested in scaling or some of the stuff we talked about today, which is a little bit dense, you can check out some of these articles, uh, which I think are really great. The first one is like a, an improvement proposal that we created that introduces these uh, L, L1 call uh, precompiles, which we think will benefit like the whole L2 ecosystem. And we'd love to like work on together, get your feedback. And if you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, like we'd love to hear your feedback to see if this is something the L2s can work on together. And yeah, these are just a whole bunch of other um, little research articles on booster rollups and stuff uh, uh, if you'd like to read about it. So uh, hopefully you have time for questions, but yeah. Hey, very cool. Uh, two quick questions. First, when it comes to booster rollups, I think that if you guys deploy a good proxy, you're gonna get majority of users working out of the box because storage is usually kept in proxies, like diamond proxy, transparent proxy, so it will be like done. Right. This is right. one thing I'm looking forward. Yeah. Second for the RLP, because um, you will be doing L1 call to a different block, right? If I understand correctly, Tyco. Tyco is an L2, which means that if within this L2 I'm doing an L1 call, will this L2 transaction end up in the same block, or could there be something happening in the middle? Um, okay, so yeah, the L1 call would happen. Are you saying that like the L1 call would happen at like a certain height for like an L1 block or? So this, is, this is exactly the question, right? Because yeah. like at which moment will L1 call, like you're kind of accessing the L1 state as of some, some history because the moment that the block is included or the moment when the block is executed, like. Yeah, I, I believe it would be like the, we would need like a certain uh, height that's like ex ex acceptable, that's been like finalized enough on the L1 that we can call. But I think there's also some ideas of like doing like a remote call and trying to fetch, like do these L1 calls at like a certain previous height that you can specify. Um, I think we're also considering adding that as a precompile as well. But the default case, I'm not 100% sure about, honestly. But um, yeah, uh, actually, the, uh, our CTO is here as well. If you'd like to chat more about it, uh, yeah, we can go into depth. And, and, or, or you can open uh, something up on, on this uh, uh, link as well. We'd really uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Or? All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Nice.